This is Examine Sport, a podcast of the Sports Ethicist. I am your host, Sean Klein. Each episode of Examine Sport focuses on an argument or concept in the philosophy of sport literature. We will look at classic, discipline-defining articles, exciting, newly published works, and dig deep for important but not as well-known papers. You can subscribe, comment, and find an archive of all the shows, along with links and related information, at sportsethicist.com. In the episode on Warren Farley's Why the Good Foul is Not Good, I discussed Farley's argument that intentional fouls ought not to be permissible since they are rule violations. Now, as part of the general discussion, <clears throat> Farley cited Edwin Jay's Delaterre's Some Reflections on Success and Failure in Competitive Athletics. Now, in this paper, in Delaterre's paper, we see several themes that the podcast has so far been focused on. The constitutive role of rules, the danger of violating those rules, and what the purpose or meaning of sport is. Delaterre's paper, nevertheless, offers a few novel things worth discussing. Now, two things that I want to focus on are, one, the distinctions between success and winning, as well as failure and losing. And also, as that this paper is one of the earliest explicit accounts of the incompatibility thesis. Now, the focus on success and failure here is pretty obvious, right? It's right there in the title, but it's more than that. It's important. Many people think of success in sport as equal to winning and failure as equal to losing. But there are important ways in which these concepts differ. Right? And Delaterre is not trying to downplay the importance of winning. He says in his conclusion, quote, it matters whether we win or lose, end quote. But there's more to it than merely winning or losing. It's important how we play. Do we play well or badly? Are we good sports or not? It matters who we play. Are they worthy component, uh, opponents? Can they challenge us, push us? How we play and against whom we play give meaning and substance to the contest and the victory. To beat a far weaker opponent or to behave disrespectfully towards the opponent is not necessarily something to be proud of. To lose but to do so with grace, having given one's all and never having let up, is nothing to be ashamed of. So there is winning and losing, and these matter. But there's something more here. Something more about the game that is not the same as winning and losing. As Delaterre says, quote, success in competitive athletics is not reducible to winning nor failure to losing, end quote. Success in sport needs an additional account. It's not identical to or reducible to winning. There is the possibility of success in sport without winning, just as there is the possibility of failure without losing. Now, this account of success is tied into the purpose of sport. What is the ultimate value of sport? From this conception, we can test whether a given instance is successful or not. Now, Delaterre doesn't directly or clearly state what the purpose or ultimate meaning of sport is. Nevertheless, he paints a picture of what it is by discussing great sporting moments and getting at the purpose of sport from what makes them great. So the moment is when the game is most of all a test. The moments of significance in the game, the turning points, which all the practice and diligence and preparation point to and anticipate, end quote. Those moments, quote, when no let up is possible, when there's virtually no tolerance for error, end quote. These moments show us, says Delaterre, why we play sport or why we watch, what makes it worth it. And this shows us that sports value is rooted in self-discovery. Quote, the importance rests squarely on their providing for us opportunities for self-discovery. Quote, they provide opportunities for self-discovery, for concentration and intensity of involvement, for being carried away by the demands of the contest and thereby in part for being able to meet them. End quote. So sport, in its best and greatest moments, pushes us, challenges us to do our best, 
to discover about ourselves what we are able to do and how far we are willing to go and whether we're able to meet those challenges. Delter argues that it is with respect to this conception of sport that we should define success and failure in sport. Quote, it's in the face of these demands and with respect to them that an athlete succeeds or fails, end quote. These experiences, these defining moments of challenge in sport can only be generated when you have worthy opponents faced off against each other. Quote, opponents who are capable of generating with us the intensity of competition, end quote. There needs to be a rough balance of talent, skill, preparation, and respect among competitors. Quote, competition, contesting, if you will, thus requires commensurate opponents, end quote. It's only against such opponents that we can truly test ourselves. If there's too much imbalance either way, either we are unworthy of a superior opponent or we are the superior, far superior opponent, there really is no test, no real challenge to generate the intensity, the moments that matter. Success then is a factor of finding the best competition and contending against that competition as best one can. Victory in the game is a separate matter from success. The success lies in achieving the purpose of sport, the self-discovery of meeting the challenge and the demand of the contest. So what about failure? What is failure then? Well, it's to not meet the challenge, not by losing the game, but by not contending at all, by choosing only unworthy opponents, by not preparing properly, and of course, by cheating. Now, in many ways, cheating is the worst sort of failure. First, it's a moral failing. It treats the opponents with disrespect. It treats them as a mere means, as a, a tool, as an instrument, rather than as an end, as a person in their own right. And it makes the game a sham. A real victory is not achieved. It's only the appearance of a victory. If you seem to have won the game but cheated, have you really beaten the opponent? Similarly, if you cheat on an exam and get an A, have you demonstrated the competency with the material of the exam that the A is supposed to indicate? No. They're both shams. No real victory is achieved. Now, a second way in which cheating is a failure is logically. Quote, competing, winning and losing in athletics are intelligible only within the framework of rules which define a specific competitive sport. A person may cheat at a game or compete at it, but it is logically impossible for him to do both. To cheat is to cease to compete, end quote. This is in part what makes it the worst kind of failure. Cheating is a failure even to compete. If one is a bad sport or otherwise behaves badly in the match, it might be a moral failure, but there's still a sense of competing. But in cheating, one fails to compete at all. And so the competitive act doesn't even come into existence. It come into existence. It's null. Now, Delater doesn't provide a definition of cheating. But it's pretty clear that he sees cheating as a deliberate violation of the rules of the game. In the context of cheating, he talks about athletes as violating the rules which govern the competition, as a failure to compete with others in accordance with the rules. The closest he gets to a definition is, quote, to commit an act which merits a penalty, to do so knowingly and not to incur the penalty, is to cease to play the game. End quote. So, but Delter is a bit ambiguous. He doesn't always explicitly distinguish between deliberate and accidental violations, though I think it's clear he recognizes such a difference exists, but isn't too worried about accidental violations. Nor does he explicitly distinguish between deliberate violations that are deceptive and those that are done openly. That is, Delter doesn't address the issue of the intentional strategic foul, Farley's good foul. And given what Del Delaterre has said about rule violations, one might think it's pretty obvious that Delaterre would see such fouls as Frale does, as a wrongful act that destroys the conditions of competing. 
that Delaterre would see these as a kind of failure. Now that may be, but if we look back at what Delaterre had to say about cheating, he talks about it as a rule violation that goes unpunished, that does not incur a penalty. That is, the paradigm case of cheating is someone who violates the rule and covers it up so that they are not caught and don't have to incur the penalty. He leaves open then the question about one who violates the rule but is willing to incur the penalty. So, for example, the basketball player who trades giving the opportunity, the, sorry, giving the opponent two foul shots for the opportunity to stop the clock and get possession, or the soccer player who trades giving the opponent a free kick for the chance to set up the defense and prevent a breakaway run by the opponent. In these cases, the penalty is assess, assessed on the offending player or team, and the game continues. Delaterre doesn't address these kinds of cases, and so it's not obvious that he has to go Prale's route in decrying such fouls, nor towards permitting them. There is space here to make a case either way. In other words, formalism doesn't necessarily have to rule out strategic fouls. Now, I want to turn to the second point that makes Delaterre's paper so interesting. This is the logical incompatibility thesis. Now, earlier I pointed out Delaterre's argument that cheating was a logical failure, that Logically, one can compete or one can cheat, but they can't logically do both. Quote, a person may cheat at a game or compete at it, but it is logically impossible for him to do both. To cheat is to cease to compete, end quote. <clears throat> or again, quote, the cheater is logically prohibited from competing and therefore from winning, end quote. So Delaterre is saying that cheating and competing are like being a married bachelor or a square circle. It's logically impossible, right? It's logically impossible to be both a square and a circle, to be married and to be unmarried. And according to the logical incompatibility thesis, to be cheating and competing. Now, this idea is not really new to listeners. I've talked about something like it before, and it's not really new for Delaterre. It's one of the central claims of formalism. Both Suits and Frale talk about the relationship between the rules and the ends of the games, and that to violate constitutive rules is to fail to play the game. Indeed, many refer to this incompatibility thesis as Suits' logical incompatibility thesis, because the, the root of the idea is in Suits. But the explicit framing of cheating and competing as, quote, logically impossible is, I think, something new. Suits doesn't use the phrase in the elements of sport or what is a game. He doesn't talk about the game failure in terms explicitly of logical impossibility. And being logically impossible certainly makes it at least sound like a much stronger claim, even if it's the same, even if ultimately it's the same claim, it at least rhetorically sounds like a stronger claim. With the earlier discussions of the idea, there might have been some wiggle room here. But once you start talking about it being logically impossible, there is no more wiggle room. Now, I don't know if Delaterre is, in fact, the first to frame it this way, but he is certainly one of the earliest of putting it, the ideas into these terms. And, uh, you know, as a side note, if a listener is aware of an earlier explicit formulation in terms of logical impossibility, I'd love to hear about it. Please leave a note in the comments or send me an email. So anyway, the logical incompatibility thesis is central to formalism. William Morgan calls it the linchpin of formalism. It's important to debates about the nature of cheating and other rule violations. Conventionalists like D'Agostino, who we talked about earlier in an earlier episode, partly criticize formalism by attacking the incompatibility thesis. In later attempts to answer these criticisms from the conventionalists and others lead to new formulations of different theories of sport. So it's exciting, at least, to see where this idea began to take the form that has had such an important impact on the philosophy of sport. Thank you for listening to Examine Sport. You can subscribe, comment, and find an archive of all the shows, along with links and related information at sportsethicist.com. Please also consider rating the show on iTunes, liking it on YouTube, and sharing on Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere. You can email the show, sportsethicist, at gmail.com. 